Section number 16 from the Easy Chair, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume 1 by George William Curtis. Section number 16 Easter Bonnets. It is not a great many years ago that among Protestants in this country, Easter was mainly the festival of one denomination, and even within that denomination, it was celebrated with comparatively little pomp. But now it is universal, especially in the larger towns and cities, and many churches decorate themselves with flowers and observe with annually accumulating splendor the great feast of the immortal hope. The churches are filled with people, the music is elaborate, and it is elaborately advertised during the preceding week and by one of these odd coincidences which associate the most diverse things it is on easter day that the new spring bonnets of the ladies appear and there is a delightful mingling of most diverse interests i have observed said an elderly gentleman as he watched from the window of his club the pretty procession of new clothes winding churchward on easter morning that some ladies of high fashion dress more and more elaborately as they advance in years and as the sweet light of youth fades from their eyes it is replaced by a greater blaze of diamonds upon their persons. It was the venerable ambassador from Sennar who spoke, and who was smiling pleasantly upon the cheerful scene. For myself, he continued, I can recall nothing more enchanting in human form than the granddaughter of my old friend, whom I went to see some years ago in Newport, and who bounded in at the open window from the garden on a perfect June morning, herself incarnate June, clad in a white muslin dress her hair simply knotted behind, holding a rose in her hand, and with the loveliest rose in her cheeks. That young woman, a girl not yet twenty, now has girls of her own more than twenty. I wonder if she wears a very elaborate bonnet this Easter morning, and whether her dress is a mass of pleats and puffs and marvellous trimmings, which, when profusely extravagant upon the form of an elder woman, always reminds me of signals of distress hung out upon a craft that is drifting far away from the enchanted isles of youth is it the instinctive effort to prolong the brilliancy of youth that induces the advancing woman to decorate herself so brightly is it the involuntary hope that she will really seem to be buoyant and gay of heart if only her dress be gay as they go trooping by that richly comparisoned dowager and i recall the days when i was merely an attache of the embassy and when in the modest parlor in bond street she sang i wad not walk in silk attire nor silly your head to spare Gin I must from my true love part, nor think on Donald Mayer. The old gentleman from Sennar is always permitted to have his own way, and he prattles on without interruption. If you don't care to listen, it is always easy to withdraw, and to look out at another window, and to make your own comments instead of heeding his. But that was not exactly what I had in mind as I watched this pretty Easter procession, resumed the venerable ambassador. But the truth is, when I see a crowd of brightly dressed women, my mind scatters as it were, and I am very apt not to hit my mark. The old gentleman smiled again. All the fine spring bonnets of Easter Sunday do not prove the youth of every face under them. And I wonder whether this splendid celebration of Easter means that you are a more religious people than in the plainer Easter days that I remember. Is the sincerity of religious feeling always in proportion to the magnificence of the ritual? If it be, you have become a deeply religious people, especially in your great city. We used to think at the legation in Rome that the people of that city were in danger of mistaking a punctual observance of religious ceremonies for religion. But you are so intelligent that you are, of course, in no such danger. I accept these beautiful flowers and this pretty procession of new bonnets as the proof of your religious progress. The ambassador paused reflectively a moment and then continued. You send a great many missionaries to India and elsewhere. Is it because you have no work for them at home? In my country, my benighted and heathen sinar, we have a proverb that an ounce of practice is worth a pound of profession. In Rome, I say, we used to fear lest the people, with crossings and dippings and genuflections and repetitions of a long series of invocations and confessions and penance and many ceremonies, might come to confound these things with religion. But I suppose that this blossoming Easter, this solemn abstination from the German in Lent, and this interest in draperies and postures mean that you devote the same energy and time and care to studying how to help the helpless, how to console the suffering, 
how to teach poverty, to hope and labor for its own relief. It means that the richly attired Christians who are walking in the most fashionable spring bonnets to church on Easter Sunday have learned who is their neighbor, and what their duty is towards him, and are diligently doing it. The ambassador removed his eyeglasses and turned to smile blandly upon the group of clubmen near him. This reflection, he continued, makes me very happy and fills me with reverence for a Christian people. For if you built superb churches in one street and tolerated heathen squalor of soul and body in the next street, you would crucify Christianity. No, no. These sweet flowers of Easter are not symbols of your words, but of your work, not of your professions, but of your practice. The old gentleman resumed his glasses and looked silently at the thronged street. How comfortable to believe with our venerable friend and to perceive that the great increase in the beauty of the Easter commemoration is the fitting symbol of a corresponding increase in our religious faith and practice. End of section 16. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America.